Hey guys, I'm Steve, also known as Terramantis, and with the influx of new players to the Monster Hunter series, and with the PC version of World right around the corner, I thought it'd be a good idea to cover some aspects of the game that are extremely important to being a good hunter that the game itself doesn't really explain very well, or at all. And if I was new to the series, these are things that I would definitely want to know when first setting out. With that said though, there are some tips and strategies that are for more advanced players, or for those who are at or along the way to the end game. So let's start with some really easy general tips and then we'll get into more advanced stuff as we go. To start is something that I see even advanced players not utilizing to their advantage more than anything else, which is environmental traps. These are aspects of the natural environment that can be used to damage or restrain monsters, and in some cases, both. These various environmental hazards, from paralytic toads and flash flies, to the real star, vine traps and collapsible pillars. Not only do many of these hazards damage the monsters themselves, but they also allow your team to do uninterrupted damage for a short time, providing easy access to strike breakable monster parts with your weapon's strongest attacks. So to say these traps are important is an understatement. But nowhere are they more important than with Elder Dragons. There are a few Elder Dragons that enter rooms with various collapsible pillars, and this is a great way to do thousands of damage and knock down some of the toughest monsters with relative ease. Now, this next tip won't work on Elder Dragons because they're immune to hunter-made traps, but it is a tip for dealing extra damage to any normal monster. And all it really boils down to is not being afraid to use your hunter-made traps early in a hunt just as a means for your team to dish out some serious damage. I personally advise using shock traps as they deploy much faster than pitfalls, but pit traps can work as well. Either way you look at it, hunter-made traps are definitely something that I've noticed that's underutilized for damage purposes. One thing to note though, and that's very important, is that traps do have diminishing returns. In other words, the more times you use a specific trap on a monster, the faster it will be able to break free of shock or pitfall traps. So, don't be afraid to use traps for extra damage, but also don't go crazy with them either. The next tip is pretty simple. Put crafting recipes on your action wheel, like flash pods or mega bombs or shock traps. This will allow you to craft items on the fly as long as you have the components in your inventory. In other words, if you have three flash pods and ten flash bugs in your inventory, if you run out of flash pods you can quickly craft together three more pods and equip them, putting your total carryable flash pods at 13 without having to restock. Now, the next topic goes hand in hand with this idea, and that is, never drink normal potions to restore health. Instead, bring 10 mega potions and then accompany those with 10 normal potions and 10 honey. The normal potions and honey are the components needed to craft mega potions. This way, when you run out of mega potions or are getting low, you can easily craft more mega potions on the fly while out in the field, putting you at a total of 20 mega potions without needing to restock. Alright, the next one has to do with weapons, more specifically a stat, or really a hidden stat that can be an attribute on some weapons. For some weapons you might be looking at the damage and think, Damn, that has a lot of raw damage, and the elemental damage is high too. Well, that might be the case, but in some situations, that elemental damage is actually hidden, or lying dormant. So the deal is, if you're looking at a weapon's elemental or ailment damage numbers and they're grayed out, that means that the weapon's secondary properties are actually hidden, and your attacks are not benefiting from those properties. To unlock these dormant powers hidden in many weapons, you'll need a skill. That skill is called Free Element, and this skill can be obtained in several different ways, through gear with the Free Element skill, or there's also a pretty rare decoration as well. With three points into the Free Element skill, you unlock the full 100% potential of your weapon's true hidden power. Now speaking of hidden powers, the next one has to do with several very important items that are an absolute necessity to make you passively a better, more powerful hunter, but they can easily be overlooked. Those items are the Power Charm, the Power Talon, Armor Charm, and the Armor Talon. Both the Armor Charm and Armor Talon stack to increase your defense, and the Power Charm and Power Talon stack to increase your attack. And it's important to note that these are not consumable items. To gain these buffs, all you have to do is have these items sit in your inventory. So, for the price of 4 inventory slots, you gain 15 attack 
and 30 defense. Now to obtain the armor charm and power charm, all you have to do is buy them from the provision stockpile merchant in Astera. The armor charm is 24,000 zenny, and the power charm is 36,000 zenny, for a total of 60,000 zenny. So that covers both charms. Now to get the armor talon and power talon, you'll have to craft them. And to do that, they'll eventually be unlocked in your crafting list after killing Basil Geese. So after killing Basil Geese, to craft the talons, you have to combine your armor and power charms with Basil Geese talons. So then after you craft the talons, you will need to purchase the armor and power charms once more putting the total cost of these trinkets at 120,000 zenny. And in the early game, that's pretty costly, but it's very much worth the money. All right, so on that note, let's talk briefly about one of the best methods that I've found to make money. Really, all it's broke down to is farming the Great Jagras very quickly. The catch is that you need to be hitting the Jagras as much as possible while also wearing the Bandit Mantle. With the Bandit Mantle on, the more you hit a monster, the more they drop trade and items, which are worth zenny. So you want a weapon that hits often and hits fast. Dual Blades in Demon Mode is a good option for this. Or I personally use the Heavy Bow Gun that has Wyvern Heart. And this is what a run looks like. I grab an investigation for Great Jagras, go to the first camp, run to where Jagras is pathing, because it's always the same route every time, lay a trap in that path, pop my bandit mantle, my crit sprinkler, and then unload the heavy bow gun's wyvern heart in its face. Then, if it lives through the Wyvern Heart, with all close range modifiers in the bow gun, start firing spread shot. After this, there's a lot of shinies to pick up from the bandit mantle proccing, and these drops is where the real money is at. So, after looting all the trade-in items, just either kill or capture the Jagras, and you're all done. At the final hunt screen, I grab the armor spheres and usually just sell the rest for around 15 to 20,000 zenny per run. And, like I said before, that's not including the trade-in items. Depending on the number of drops, it's safe to say that you'll earn anywhere from 35,000 to 55,000 zenny with this method every 5 minutes or less. Now to speed up that farming process, it's a good idea to save various loadouts. You can do this for both equipment loadouts, as well as inventory item loadouts. This is great for instantly swapping gear, decorations, charms, and consumable items to suit a specific hunt you're about to embark upon. For instance, like I mentioned earlier, Elder Dragons are immune to shock and pitfall traps, so there's really no reason to bring traps on Elder Dragon runs. It's nice to simply click a button on a saved loadout to change your gear or items so easily and quickly. Definitely set these up. The next tip is simple but critical and that is to come to a hunt prepared. By now you should have your loadouts all set up. You should have crafting components on your radial menu to be able to craft on the fly. And you should have your armor and power charm along with your armor and power talent, all to make you a better, more effective hunter, but that's not enough. It's important to buff your character at the start of a hunt. Make sure to drink demon drug and armor skin. These will give you an armor and attack buff that persists until you faint or a hunt is finished. Additionally, another thing you should do at the start of a hunt that's extremely important is to always eat before a hunt. So let's jump into that a bit because the meal system is probably the most convoluted, poorly explained, and confusing part of Monster Hunter to newcomers that's actually very important. So let's talk about the canteen ingredients, food buffs, and food skills. So to start, let's discuss the ingredient types and ignore everything else for a moment. Okay, so there's four different kinds of ingredients. Meat, fish, veggies, and alcohol. Not including the alcohol, each ingredient provides a specific type of buff when consumed in pairs. Meat gives an attack buff, fish gives a defense buff, and veggies give an elemental resistance buff. Each buff of attack, defense, and elemental resistance has three different tiers of potency, small, medium, and large. For every two ingredients of the same type consumed, that potency will go up one tier. For example, if you eat two fish, you will gain a small defense buff. If you eat four fish, you will gain a medium defense buff. And if you eat six fish, you will gain the large defense buff. The ingredient types can also be mixed up for different combinations, like four veggies to gain a medium elemental resistance, and two meat for a small attack buff, and so on. So that's food buffs. Now let's talk about food skills and fresh ingredients. Now fresh ingredients are meat, 
fish, veggies, and alcohol that are indicated by a sparkle. And fresh ingredients have two purposes. One, with each piece of fresh food you consume, your health and stamina will be increased for a hunt. And two, each fresh ingredient added to your meal will increase your chances of obtaining that food skill passive ability. And those chances of obtaining the food skill passive ability is indicated by red stars in the corner of the meal interface. In short, the more freshness you add, the higher it goes up, and the more likely you are to get the food skills applied. Now, food skills are additional passive abilities you can gain through eating ingredients with matching properties. The corresponding property is indicated by the color in the corner of the ingredient. There are currently seven different properties or colors. And for every two matching colors, you have a chance at receiving that specific food skill. For example, if you have two reds of any meat, fish, or veggies, you will have a chance at receiving the Tier 1 Courage buff of Feline Polisher, which often speeds up the sharpening of your weapon. If you have four reds, you'd have a chance at the Tier 2 Courage food skill, and if you had six reds, you'd have a chance at the highest Tier 3 Courage food skill. Now, just like with the meat, fish, and veggie buffs before, you can mix these ingredients. For example, you could have four of the light yellow food properties to have a chance at the Tier 2 Artillery food skill, and two blues to have a chance at the Tier 1 Resistance resilience food skill. The catch is, you need to have fresh ingredients to have a good chance at getting the food skills you want. And the food skills that you want might not always necessarily be the food that's fresh. That is, of course, unless you use a meal voucher to order your food. When using a meal voucher, you're guaranteed to receive all the corresponding food skills. Last but not least, and in the sake of thoroughness and to explain all the food symbols, if you're in a hunting lobby with someone who has unlocked any ingredients that you have not unlocked personally, the other player's ingredients will be listed for you to order with your meals. And other player's ingredients are indicated by this orange ribbon. In other words, if you're playing with someone who has unlocked all the food, then you'll have access to all the ingredients as well. Alright, that was a long one. Don't worry, the next one is short and sweet. Let's discuss Monster Mounting 101. And first and foremost, the cardinal rule of monster mounting is don't attack monsters when another hunter mounts it. It's as easy as that. While another teammate is mounted, hacking away, use this time to sharpen your weapon. Buff yourself or teammates, eat a ration, whatever. Just don't attack a monster when another hunter is mounted. Instead, prepare yourself, follow it around, and then get ready to do damage after it topples over. All right, the next one is a quick tip for people still going through the story mode or trying to complete a special investigation of Monster Hunter World. And special investigations are basically quests to track down a random, unknown monster. Well, to help speed up this task, make sure you have the skill Scholar. Scholar is an important skill because it has the ability to speed up progress on research levels and special investigations, meaning you'll get these quests done much faster. And one of the easiest ways to get this skill is by crafting the Hunter's Headgear Alpha piece. Alright, moving on. Regardless of your personal progress, the end game of Monster Hunter is really all about farming decorations and augmentations to craft your idea of the perfect build. Well, to farm decorations and augmentations, you need to hunt tempered monsters and tempered elder dragons. So this topic is going to cover the best methods I've found to farm tempered monster investigations. And to do that, you're going to need to smell a lot of tempered spit, snot, and footprints. But before we can talk about farming investigations, let's briefly cover tempered monsters in general. First off, tempered monsters are simply stronger versions of their normal counterparts. Additionally, they come in three different threat categories. Threat level 1 tempered monsters will be easy to find. You'll gain the ability to fight them long before you finish the main story of the campaign. Threat level 2 tempered, on the other hand, well, they're not unlocked until Hunter rank 29, when the game tasks you with killing two tempered basil geese. After defeating the pair of Beelzebub bombers, you'll have access to all the tempered monsters besides Elder Dragon. Now, to unlock tempered Elder Dragons, you'll have to reach Hunter rank 49 and defeat a tempered Kirin. Okay, now that all the tempered monsters are unlocked, let's talk about farming tempered investigations to get those sweet, sweet decorations. Really, the long and short of this farming method is very simple. Essentially, all you have to do is get a tempered monster investigation that's 50 minutes long. That's the most important aspect. Then, enter the investigation. Wait a long time, about 25-30 minutes, after that time goes by, put on your ghillie mantle and go pick up a lot of prints. 
That's the gist of it. Now, to maximize this method, personally I've found that for threat level 2 monsters that Diablos is the best investigation. This is because Diablos stays very localized to his cave, leaving many prints in a very small area. And as for threat level 3 elder dragons, Nergigante is the best for the same reasons. Nergigante stays on a very tight-knit path, piling prints in a very small area. So just do this a few times and I promise you'll have some great tempered hunts to go on. Alright guys, that's about it. I really do hope this video helped you out in some way. I wanted to create a good one-stop shop for all the best practices that I've been sharing with my friends that are new to the series. So in that regard, if you did find the video helpful, please hit the like button. It really goes a long way with the success and searchability of videos. It helped me out a lot and I'd really appreciate it. Alright guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.